editor in one of my lives, and, and it's, it's true, but you have to always consider that at the end of that draft that you so lovingly alter, because that's your passion, there is a movie. Um, the primary role of Virginis, um, you should have read this already, and I think you've gone through the goals and the aspiration, and, and Tom and I, and even before I, I brought Tom in, because I had a, an initial meeting with Nani and, and Binet and Lippe, and I was just so impressed with the work they put into it and the need for this program. If I'm teaching writing, and as Tom said, I can bring people here as a goal and here's something to aspire to and something worthwhile learning, a worthwhile skill. And one of the things I tell my students, other than I love being an editor because there's no passion in the world equal to altering someone else's draft, if you don't like writing, you don't have to write if you don't have any ideas. If you have ideas, you have to write. You want to communicate those ideas. And part of that communication is helping other people communicate their ideas, being a good reviewer, um, informative, and almost taking a leadership in that reviewer relationship with the authors, and encouraging our undergraduates to pursue this, and our graduate students, and our reviewers, because it all adds to our experience and our skills as uh, communicators. So know your limits, and here's one of the things that I wanted to stress with our under, if there are any undergraduates here. You need to know your limits. If you're a reviewer and you look at a paper and you feel that it's over your head, you're not going to understand it. You have to trust that instinct and tell your editor immediately, I don't feel um, able to review this article, if they offered me a fourth year genetics course, I'd have to say, honestly, I don't think I'm ready for that yet. Or even a grade 13 math. Not that I didn't do well in grade 13 math. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I would have to review many, many years of it. So trust your instincts. You have to be honest. And that includes not only your expertise or your ability to be able to review that paper, but the time commitment. Never say yes if you mean no. We don't volunteer things that we can't do. You want to give that review mm -hmm. adequate time. So those who publish, you know that the time, it can be weeks to get it back and forth. I had this simple little two-page article um, about education, and it just went on forever, going back and forth and back and forth with revisions and changes. Um, quality over quantity, so if you're looking for a reviewer, of course you're looking for quality of reviews, not quantity of reviews. It's not a race to the finish or you no know, rewards for the top number of reviews done. No, I didn't think so. And to report any conflict of interest. So if you're a TA in the course, or well, the editor's in board, but for example, that may be a conflict of interest, uh, you should report that, any conflict of interest. So if that's something that you do as an author, in your subject area, but that's something that you might want to think about as a reviewer, if there's any conflict of interest. Now this is a double blind. You don't know who you're reviewing, but there may be something in that article that you recognize. You know, there are uh, fourth year's honors project, might be in your lab, and it lands on your desktop, and you recognize that as being a product of your lab, and just report that as well, even though you don't know who the author is, you might actually recognize that, and it's better to always err on the side of caution. Um, following the instructions, understand the expectations. So you know the goals of the virginist, but to go through again, and we'll do this at a later time, at your leisure or at your request, of the reviewer form and the style guidelines, etc. Maybe we can bring more people into the fold when we get to that stage of looking at those guidelines of the review process itself, filling out the form, um, adding your comments, and uh, submitting articles. So 
So with the style guidelines, I believe uh, they were handed out. All of you may not have had that, but I wasn't prepared to go into that today. I was hoping to put that on to a later meeting where we could all have the labs or I could put it up online myself and we could talk about those style guidelines. I wanted to give a more informal talk today. And don't be afraid to ask. This could be uh, a long-term relationship perhaps, um, external reviews, and it's, it's an ongoing process. It's something that you can look forward to do for many, many, many years in the future. Uh, purpose of the peer review, to promote new ideas and different views. So it, you have a really good paper and the editor looks at it and says, well, this is really good. You have one person saying, yes, this is really good. Well, why not get three or four sides? to that story. And looking at different papers and reading something maybe perhaps outside of your, a little bit out of your, your area, but you're still expert enough to give comments to it. And you're always looking at different stories because articles are stories. You're writing a narrative of what you were trying to solve and what you were trying to say to the community. Um, so new ideas and perspectives. and to maintain the integrity of the journal. Anyone can launch an open access journal, but to launch an open access peer review journal is a much stronger commitment to the scientific community. It requires a lot more thought and work and energy and people hours to get that peer review designation. So we want to search out and destroy the faulty or weak approaches or analyses. In one way, it protects the journal. In another way, it protects the author. Now, really, do you want to publish a paper that talks about difficulties of mitosis in E. coli? Even non-biologists probably recognize the error in that. Although the experiment might have been valid, valid approach, and the results are, are reasonable, but when you're talking about these conclusions, calling E. coli a bacterium, a nucleate cell, well that's just wrong and we, we want to catch those little errors and that's part of the review process. Faulty computation statistical references, um, is it really significant? And again, if you're not comfortable reading the statistics, um, you can tell your editorial board. Well, I can see this, but I'm not comfortable with the statistics. And then you can ask your editorial board um, what you can do about that or, or what options exist for that kind of review. And uh, what if your author writes a paper, it's a beautiful paper, and never refers to anything else in the literature? Well, that's almost pompous, but it could be ignorant. And a simple review, bring in more citations. Do your homework, because when you write a scientific article, you're expected to go out there and see what is already there in the community and what other perspectives are saying, what other views are bringing to that field of study. So before you commit to the review, go over the abstract before and after. Not that, not accepting the ability to review it, but before you get down to actually writing the review, read your abstract before and after the paper. So you want a concise summary of the paper with a statement of intent and conclusions. Does the information in the abstract coincide? Is it way out in left field? Is it a buy now, pay later kind of abstract? Or is it consistent with, with what is in the field? I've read abstracts where they're talking about three different approaches and the third approach, 100% accuracy. But when you went to the discussion section, it said we did three samples. Not very valuable. I mean, all know we would never cite from an abstract. However, is it consistent with what you read in the paper? Is it cut and paste? So you read it before, you read the paper, and then you read it after, and you say, that last sentence in the abstract is exactly the same as the last sentence in the discussion. And you don't, you say don't publish because of that? No, but that's a, that's a comment that needs to be 
give them to the author. Um, thou shalt not cut and paste. That's kind of nasty and lazy. Not that it's wrong, it's just it's something that should not be done. It really looks tacky. Today I did a little paper and it was in a kind of junior little paper. And they did exactly that. They copied and pasted the last sentence of the discussion into their abstract. And I said, well, that's why they're not being published in Nature. But it doesn't mean that you can't strive for that kind of quality in an undergrad research journal. Uh, the introduction is the statement of intent there. Do they give the background why bother? After you read the intro introduction, do you understand why the study is important? Because they've done their homework and that piece of information is missing. Those of you who have already done your proposal, you know that that's a critical part of your proposal. Why are you doing or why do you think you want to do what you're submitting to your advisory committee? Well, it's because that piece of information is missing and you have to convince them that your study is important enough to support. Because that's what you're doing when you're, you're writing a thesis or, or making a proposal. You're looking for support to be able to do that and pursue that, that degree, that um, paper chip. Uh, the scope of the investigation, is it within limits? Is it limited or is it unlimited? Is it just the right scope in the paper or the intent defined in the introduction? Varied sources from past work. So here it's not a matter of counting up the citations. Here again, it's a matter of quality over quantity. But one good citation is not high enough quality to say, okay, the quantity doesn't matter. You need varied sources, and one quality does not give you varied sources. It gives you one source. So you want to look at the kind of homework and other perspectives they're bringing into their introduction, and you need to look at the statement of intent. Is it clearly stated that thesis statement? And those of you who have gone through proposals or papers, one of those, one of the most difficult things to write in an introduction is that statement of intent. Is a hypothesis appropriate? There are some experiments or studies that don't require a hypothesis. It's a bare observation, or it's something that's not manipulated. You're merely making an observation. Perhaps this occurs in health sciences more often than in bio biology or chemistry. I'm not sure. And then the background and the language. Is it appropriate for the journal, for the goals of the journal, and for the audience? Methods and results, well, that's why you publish, because it's new, never been done before. We need to know the methods, and we want to publish and communicate the results. So is the approach clearly defined? Are they missing something? Are they missing steps? Are they telling you they did a gel and not tell you the manufacturer of the equipment? Or is there enough information that you could reasonably um, repeat the experiment? If it's a case involving human subjects, was there an ethics board review? Was there consent made? Have they gone through the proper channels to publish a paper using human subjects? And that's a very important aspect as well in the methods and results. Uh, sources of error and uncertainties that somewhere in the paper. Uh, too much detail, not enough detail. That often happens in biology, perhaps with some of the uh, biology students. But if they have friends, they're obviously like, don't tell us how many pipettes you use. That's too much information. Or you need to tell us um, the concentration of your reagent. That's very important, <coughs> the concentration of antibiotics. So you need to look for that balance when you're reviewing these papers. Uh, the results and the graphics, are they clearly presented? Can you tell which is the dependent and the independent variable? And are they organized well in following the guidelines of the journal? And statistics. I'm not a statistic major, so I'll just ask you, 
when you go through these articles and you understand statistics, are they correctly applied and interpreted? And if they're using software to run that statistical program, then they need to cite it with an additional thing to check. So the graphics, do they meet the requirements of the journals? And we can look at that when we look at the style guidelines. Is it necessary? Do they really need a graphic in there, or are they just, is it out of habit? So is it really necessary? Uh, the number of significant figures, and this might be something more in the chemistry, but do you need five decimal places to make your point? Perhaps you do. But that's something that, uh, if you're not sure, that that's one of those areas where you should ask if, you're, if you don't have the answer for that. Uh, should a figure replace the table? That's a really good comment, and I think any author who has made a table would appreciate the fact that you're suggesting this would make a wonderful figure, because you have that expertise and you know a figure would convey much more to the audience than would a table. And are they presented properly and referred to in the text? So all those little style guidelines that we have to consider in uh, graphics. So having read through the introduction, do the results coincide with the scope and aim of the investigation or the statement of intent or hypothesis? Are other works brought in? Again, we have to look to the literature, to current studies and current, <coughs> current perspectives. One thing that undergrads may do early in their, their writing career, maybe not in their, their fourth year and into grad student, but um, sometimes they will cite articles that have the same results they do, or similar results. So they may have only one variable and they treat it as something um, very simply. And they find another article that has the same type of results. You can almost put the tables on and, and get the same kind of results. But they cite that source because it has the same results, but they give no meaning to that. So you're not sure if the results are the same, was their approach the same, were their conclusions the same? What are you bringing into your argument? So just, that's just something that's common that I find in undergraduate articles. And do, is everything tied back to the introduction? One of the key rules about writing discussion is no new material. You should not see any surprises when you're write, reading through a discussion paper. Anything that's in that discussion should have been foreshadowed in the introduction. So you're not surprised when you get down to that discussion and they bring this one aspect up because it has been foreshadowed in the introduction. It's not this brand new page out of left field when you get to the, the discussion. Um, I always use this graphic, the flow of information, does it go from the general to the specific in the introduction? And often, it's almost like a mirror when you get to the discussion, and these are minor they could be stylistic points, but sometimes they're more major than just a, an order of the presentation of information. Um, so we want to, in the discussion, do the data, are the data interpreted with respect to the hypothesis? Is there analysis and interpretation? Or do they go straight to the literature? Do their opinions show through in their discussion? Sometimes undergraduates are very timid about their views and feel that they need to cite everything in their discussion, and yet their views aren't coming out. They think they're validating their views by offering you sources and citations, but they never showcase or let their light shine under the barrel because they don't put their views first. And that's the purpose of publication, to put your results, your approach, and your conclusions out to the world. And then you can back it up with other sources. So that's a, a, something to look for in your review. And then, of course, you have to see the literature. No one stands alone in the scientific world, in chemistry, in health sciences, in biology. You need to see other perspectives and bring them into that picture. So you're holding this tiny little fragment of the puzzle. How does it fit in with the big picture? And the only way to fit it into the big picture is to make connections with other points. 
and then you see the bigger picture. So implications, applications, and models of that system that's in the paper. And again, no new material for those prizes in the discussion. Look at the reference. Are they all old references? Are they all from the 50s and 60s? It's probably not a good thing because that's some ideas in the 50s and 60s that turned out to be inaccurate or not that all that biological. Um, are there important papers missing? So if you're in that field and you're reading a paper and you're thinking, well, why didn't you refer to this paper? That's a wonderful comment to pass along to your author. Say, you're missing the citation, perhaps you should read this paper, and supply the paper, supply the citation. <coughs> Excuse me. So you go through it, and then, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, now how tired was I yesterday when I wrote this? Oh, that's just too fun. Your summary should be as concise, if not more concise, than the author's. Because if you're going to re review that paper, your understanding of the subject should be just a little bit better than the students. And your spelling should be better. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time in five years, I swear. So write a paragraph about what's good about the paper. Not always necessary, but for your own, it, it might get you in a good mood and say, yeah, I like, really like that about the paper. And I'm very interested in the conclusions you wrote about the results. And then the, the major comments that you want to think about in the broad brush review of the article, or what about the assumptions? Are the assumptions valid? Are there some assumptions that are just not correct and that you made this, the, uh, the comment about E. coli and mitosis? Well, that's a major assumption and you have to deal with that in the whole scope of the paper. Is it really that minor or is it just something that you need to remind the, the author of and you'll get a bit of paper back? Or is it something more systemic? But think about the assumptions that are underlie the study the literature review and the conclusions are drawn from the results. Um, the approach to the problem, the approach to the experimental design, the analysis, the results, conclusions, and references. And you can always suggest ways. It's, the, it's easy to complain, but it's better to point out a deficiency and suggest a way to remedy that because we want to encourage people to continue to improve as writers and submit a game. Everyone wins when we do that. Uh, the minor comments, the style, grammar, spelling, conventions. By conventions I mean um, the chemical nomenclature, scientific nomenclature, number guidelines, and these will be in the style guidelines. But there are some uh, metric guidelines for numbers and uh, units of measurement. We have that, and they should be followed. So make, don't let them slide through. Watch for them, and you can make that comment under a minor comment. The figures and tables. You know, it could be a minor little tweak in the figures and tables. And then the recommendation. So you may have a lot of revisions. I still recommend the paper to be published with revisions. If you have given the, the way to remedy all of those recommendations or those deficiencies, then maybe it's an idea that deserves to be published on the condition that those deficiencies are now, uh, that they are met or they, the recommendations have been met. Um, does the paper merit publication? So that's a major consideration as you go through this review process. So you may accept if all you're giving are your comments, your major comments, your minor comments, your recommendations, and all that, 
the auditors still might not understand whether it's an accept with conditions or reject. So always make that <coughs> make that clear at the end of your review. Um, when you say no, I can't do this review. Um, it's a conflict with material, conflict of interest, or timing, and that's always a consideration in our busy lives. Um, if this happens, then tell the editor. And if you can, if you can suggest an alternate reviewer. But that's saying no. I can't look at this paper, and you need to be able to say that and be honest about that. When you say no to the article, well, I, just, I grabbed this out of the a peer review paper, 50% of articles are not <coughs> accepted. They're re 50, so 50, that leaves us with 50% rejected. Okay, I still remember how to do math. Um, why are they rejected? So 20% are rejected prior to review, so poor quality, or out of scope. You can write a good paper and, and your, your particular journal is, isn't interested in it, but you get published in another journal because of the scope. 30% um, are rejected following the review. So of the 50% accepted, 40% require revision. So only 10% are accepted as is. So we see the need for peer review, for honest peer reviews, and we realize that Good ideas don't always get through into publication, even with uh, all these checkpoints and balances. So acceptance rates were lower in the humanities and higher in physical sciences and engineering. So there are levels, and I'm sure the uh, editorial board will have more. This is just the general, this is what I'm taking. Um, from several sources. Uh, publish as is, that's a 10%. I said before, publish with minor revision, that's about 40%. Um, reject but encourage revision and invite resubmission. So this won't happen to the 8% that are out of, out of view, but it might be 13%. So these may require major revision. But it's not unlikely that it could bounce back after that major revision if the uh, and then reject it outright. If it's a train wreck, you can say that very politely, and we'll talk about that when we go through the slide five times. Yeah. Very nice ways to say train wreck. Or uh, reject but encourage more revision than is necessary for the one that is likely to uh, be accepted with minor revisions in the next few decades. Um, so, no study too fragmented, no hypothesis too trivial, no literature too biased or too egotistical, no design too warped, no methodology too bungled, no presentation of results too inaccurate, too obscure, too contradicting, no analysis too self-serving, no argument too circular, no conclusions too trifling or too unjustified, no grammar and syntax too offensive for people to end up in But we want to avoid um, so critical comments, and here I thought, given um, our little introduction at the beginning, it might be nice to share some of our stories afterwards. Um, I've included references that I have found that show this work has already been done. Okay, well it's justified. Um, this is from this is from a government um, engineering site. For proposals. Uh, state of the art, art techniques are used, but the research plan does not show the res that the researchers understand how to apply the techniques. But these are valid comments. They're nicely stated. Sound and well written proposal in the same vein of those preceding it. Well, um, compounds are tested, are logically chosen. So these are well written comments. You can read a good paper, it's more difficult sometimes, I think to write comments on a good paper. It is, you know, because you're trying to say, well, your introduction is really strong. What more can you say than that? So, sometimes that's a challenge of writing those good comments of how it's good. Um, 
the lack of technical description of what they're going to specifically do in the market and how they will do it makes the proposal very unconvincing. Well, that's a very, it's not, it's non-judgmental, but it's accurate, it's direct, and it's honest. And we can give our reviews this way. Um, Oh, well, this one, inflated, unrealistic, and undocumented? Well, that's probably true. I don't know if it's kind of abrupt, but I'm, I'm thinking. Would you take that personally if I told you your ideas were inflated? <laughs> <laughs> well, turn yeah. yeah. Uh, the need is credible and well supported by the proposal. That's something that we can do. I thought this was, was very nice, too, and I'll include it in the handout. When some time later this week. Uh, appropriate, appropriateness of the methodology cannot be judged very well because the methods applied to elicit whatever WTP is. Uh, statistical methods are not described sufficiently in the section on methodology. Okay. But the response, and we'd like to see our authors be able to take this kind of criticism and be able to respond appropriately and improve their papers. We've been more explicit in discussing our licitation methods and have changed some of the statistical reporting conventions to be more acceptable to the, the reviewer. Okay, well, this sounds nice. You're friends again. The uh, number of references is small and should be supplemented by publications as far as they are relevant for the research. That's a good way to comment on too few citations or references to other sources. We're talking about the need for varied sources in the introduction and the discussion. So the citations have been increased now 20. Right? So there might have been much fewer than that. And um, so these are appropriate comments, appropriate responses, and a way to build a relationship with the author and the journal and the review board and work towards that kind of relationship, even when it's a blind reviewer there's always a person behind there who can benefit from these kinds of insights and helpful suggestions. Bring in more references. You don't have enough citations there. It's also saving the authors from embarrassment. But we always, why not allow them the opportunity to improve? little children, I'm going to wax philosophical for a minute, child drops some milk at a, at a friend's house. Well, do you clean it up for them? You say, well, here, honey, I'll take care of the glass, but you can take care of the milk. Let them learn from their mistakes. And let them go. Uh, page 5, 6, yay saying should be defined as a tendency to say yes to a close-ended question. I'm going to find out what WT is smaller than the amount of gas. Uh, we've changed the definition to reason as, as recommended by the review. Okay. That's all part of that review process, the comments, responding to them, thinking about the person on the end of that paper whose name you don't know, whose face you can't see. Uh, this is from PhD comments. Sure. The method device paradigm the authors propose is clearly wrong. How not to respond? Yes, we know we thought we could still get a paper out of it. Sorry. The authors failed to reference the work of Smith et al. who solved the same problem 20 years ago. How not to respond? Huh? We didn't think anybody had read that. Actually, their solution is better than ours. Okay. <laughs> this um, review comment. This paper is poorly written and scientifically unsound. I do not recommend it for publication. How not to respond? You okay? <laughs> reviewer. I know who you are, I'm going to get you when it's my turn to review. <laughs> I like the correct response. That they're almost all the same. The reviewer raises an interesting concern. However, our work is based on completely different first principles. We use different variable names that have much more attractive graphical user interface. <laughs> so along um, stories, reviews, papers, if you have TA, Comments. I would hope. I would wish all my students would read their comments because I always try and make those comments allow them to be better writers. And it's not just that marking that publication. It's learning from that review process. Learning, learning stories. 